well. It was quite a series of unexpected opportunities. I got to be at Chick-fil-A for 20 years and Truett Cathy, our founder, would always talk about taking advantage of unexpected opportunities. And he, in many ways, lived his life pulling his bootstraps up each morning and going to see what the day held. And I'd say when I look back on the past 41 years of my life, I feel like it's been a lot of unexpected opportunities. I think very ordained by the Lord of open doors and a whole lot of closed doors. So a lot of my story are doors that gently closed, that slam closed, that were a fi they weren't even a real door. It was like a fictitious door I thought could be a door. Um, but I'm so thankful that the doors that did open were ones that I could walk through and so excited about everything that's to come. Who knows what the future holds, but it's been fun. And incidentally, so I started this series three months ago or so and have had, I think you're the eighth interview I've had in this series. And you're probably the fourth person that has some type of connection with Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's actually by accident. That's not intentional. It's just that as, as I get introduced to people, they're like, "Oh yeah, and I, I I've had that history too." So mm -hmm. there's some there's so much there's so many great leadership stories that come from Chick Fil A Corporation. I'm sure it's a culture that that breeds good leadership. So um, near the beginning of your book, you say knowing your purpose as a company is a way of future proofing your brand. Um, I have to acknowledge that most companies fail to do this. What are some of the things you see companies doing instead of knowing and pursuing their purpose? Mm, focusing on this quarter's results. And it's such a trap because you have to focus on what's right in front of us and what's here and now and what's working and what's not working. But the generational businesses have that long-term perspective. Simon Sinek wrote the book, Infinite Game. And I think he did a, an incredible job of articulating if we don't have a long-term uh, long focus and vision for our organizations, we're just reacting. I think it's true for our lives too. When we're just focused on like right now and this week and the hamster wheel and you know next week it'll be better and it'll slow down then, we find ourselves in this state where we're not really thinking about the long term of where we want to be and backing up into how am I living that out today. So focusing on right now, what's in front of us, this quarter's earnings, it can be a distraction sometimes from the bigger conversations of trends that are coming, who we need to be in the future, and how we're going to strategically get there. Yeah, I see that a lot with businesses. And what I have determined is, because a lot of businesses that I even consult with, even if they start off with, we want to do something that's going to make a difference in five years, and I start working with them and helping them figure out what that is, inevitably a lot of them will come back and say, oh, we're just trying to what you said. It's like it's about next quarter's earnings, which makes me think that most businesses are in survival mode and it's hard to focus on purpose when you're so worried about survival. It is. And so we got to do both because there is like, we have to survive. We have to figure out how are we going to have more revenue come in than our expenses? Like if there is no margin, there is no mission. So we got to figure that out. And how do we carve out that time and be diligent about the time to think about what's next, what's coming, our purpose, the bigger things, because those fires are never hot compared to the ones right in front of us, but it's the urgent over important. And so if we're constantly reacting to the urgent, we're not making time for the important. So even as practical as just setting aside two days a month and these two days a month all my meetings all my conversations are going to be focused on the future what trends do i see coming what risks could we have to react to how are we going to respond to that our purpose how are we aligned to that the important and then let all the other days of the month be the the urgent fires running around like a chicken with our head cut off what i love about your book is that it actually helps it doesn't just give a philosophy of of life and purpose, but actually helps guide the reader through the process of defining or, or knowing and living one's purpose. So in the book's early pages, you share five tips uh, that have helped you set the scene to do the work of self-reflection. Can you unpack those five tips for me? Yes. And I thought this was really important because some people are more comfortable with self-reflection 
than others. And so those that are wired for that, they don't even have to think about tips. They just, they just go there. But others of us, it can be really uncomfortable to think about these bigger questions and be willing to reflect upon ourselves. So that's why I put these together. The first one for me is creating the environment. My husband and I have an eight and a 10 year old. If they're buzzing around and balls are flying and all that, that is not the space for self-reflection for me. But take me out into a, a beautiful forest and sit me underneath a tree or put me in a hammock somewhere or in front of the ocean. Nature for me is a very compelling environment to still my heart and my mind. So creating the environment, whatever that looks like. For some people, that's headphones and caffeine. Other people, it's forest bathing and hammocks. So whatever that is. The second is to be mindful. I, for myself, my mind can feel like it's constantly running in all these different directions. Did I add that to my Kroger list? And have I ordered that school thing? And Valentine's Day is coming up, so I need to make sure my daughter has a red shirt. And blah, 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 blah. Being able to quiet our mind enough to create that space. Over Christmas, I put my phone up for eight days. It was hard and awesome. And I realized that my mind has so much more space when I'm not being driven by my device. So whatever that is for each individual, but just being able to be mindful. So set the environment, be mindful, and then write things down. For some people, that's typing into a phone. For some people, that's writing in a journal. For other people, it's just tearing off a piece of paper and putting a few words down. But put the thoughts down somewhere because I think the act of doing that, it, it helps our learning, it helps us process, all that. But it also documents and memorializes for a bit some of these things that might be really important for us to keep top of mind. Um, the fourth one I had said was ask questions. I love questions. There are books about questions and I love those books. I'm a very curious person. And so asking ourselves questions, and the book has a ton of questions in it, but being willing to ask ourselves some of these questions help keep us on track and help us be mindful. And then the last one for self-reflection was getting feedback from people that you trust. I find for myself that I can be my worst critic and be unfair sometimes. And sometimes I can just be blind and miss something that I need someone I trust to call out in me. So having that kind of feedback from people we trust, those wise voices to be able to say, you're not as bad as you think and you don't smell quite as good as you think either, can be really helpful for processing through some of these big questions. So those are the five that have been helpful for me. And those are incredibly helpful for someone like me who is not naturally comfortable with self-reflection. Um, I had some people come to town that I, that I do a lot of work with who offered to spend a day with me doing some yearly and quarterly planning, I said, that's great because otherwise I wouldn't do it. I need somebody that's there that can kind of help keep pushing me in that direction. So yeah, setting the scene, the environment, you know, having the accountability of the people that's, that's all su has been super helpful for me here uh, recently. So you have a chapter in the book called defining purpose. And what I love is how you distinguish what purpose is from what it isn't. And you list four things that are often referenced as though they are interchangeable with purpose. Yeah. So what are those four things and explain to us how they are indeed distinct? Yes. So I think this comes up a lot in business too. So when it's business identity and business mission, but it's also very true in our personal lives. So I felt like it was important if we say purpose is why something exists, then there's all these other elements that make up who we are or what a business is that are unique and different. So it's not identity. Identity is who you are. A brand identity of a company is who that business is. Is that a key important component that ties into our purpose? Absolutely. But they're two different things. Purpose is not values. Values are how we live our life. Values of a company are how that business operates, what they're going to be, you know, the filters for the decisions that they're making. So are our values, do they show up in our purpose? I believe so. But you can have values and not know your purpose. You can know who you are and your identity and not know your purpose. Also, it's not our mission. Mission is what you 
do. Like think about a military mission. Our mission is we're going to go in and accomplish this in this way. That's what we do. It's what we do as a business. It's what we do as individuals. You can have a clear mission of what you're going to do and not be clear on why you exist. So I thought it would be really important to be able to delineate because Life can get going so fast. We get so many layers over time of people speaking into our lives, over our lives, the thoughts we're telling ourselves about ourselves, that when you peel back all of these onion layers deep down inside, there is a purpose of why we exist. A lot of times it's just sifting through, peeling it back to find those words. And it's different than our identity. It's different than our vision. It's different than our mission. It's, it's different than our values. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned in your book that 40,000 is the number of decisions that the average person makes daily. I thought it was going to be like a year, but that apparently is the number that, that an average person makes in a single day. And that 95% of those 40,000 decisions are often made unconsciously or subconsciously. So how does knowing our purpose help us get more intentional about those 40,000 decisions? That number shocked me too. And that's not my number. That's the experts out there. So we can take, um, we can believe that. But that when we know our purpose, it helps us with all of those decisions, the ones that we're not consciously processing through and the ones that we are, it helps us make those decisions a whole lot easier. If we don't have a filter, it's kind of like um, at, at your refrigerator or at your sink when you're getting water or your air conditioner at home or in your car. Whenever I go to get my car checked, they're always like, ma'am, you want me to replace your air filter? But those filters help catch stuff. And when you think about 40,000 decisions coming your way of what you're going to choose to eat, who you're going to spend your time with, are you going to go here or do this or go there, all of that... When you think about all those decisions coming your way, that can lead to a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of questioning. Did I make the right choice? Should I have said yes to that? Why did I say no to that? And when we're as a culture fighting being busy, like so often it's like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. Well, we don't want to be busy, I don't think. I think we want to be effective. And our purpose helps us filter all of those decisions coming in to go, okay, I need to be really intentional about my yeses and my noes, and to be able to be intentional in a way that doesn't stress me out. Our purpose, knowing why we exist, helps us with that. When I know why I exist, I can process better, it's still hard, but still process better where I'm gonna spend my time, what my top priorities are, and how I'm gonna stay committed to those. 40,000's a lot. But our purpose helps as like a filter to be able to weed out our yeses and nos. For the last probably four or five years, I've gotten to work very closely with the companies that bear John Maxwell's name. There's, there's lots, and I have my hand in a lot of them. And I finally got to reading one, in one of his 82 best-selling books a couple of years ago called Intentional Living. The only reason I had it is because it came in a really cool binding. I was like, hey, that would look really cool in my bookshelf. I think I'll get it. I was like, I should probably read it, too. So I read it, and when I when he talked about, because I was thinking, okay, this is just about you know being more intentional, but really purpose was the the, the main subject of the book. And then when he was, uh, there's there's several sections in there about, you know, what it is that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing. And I realized up until that point that I never used purpose as a filter for deciding to do or not do something. I just okay, it's in front of me. Let let me do it. Let me say yes to it. I never said no. Yeah. And after reading that book, I thought, oh, yeah, um, that's why I don't feel like I'm living my purpose because I'm living everybody else's purpose for me. Yes, yes. How did that change for you when you added that additional filter to decision making? What changed? Well, again, it's it's I, I would never say no. And it, even if I was if I was in a position where I felt like my business couldn't say no, I could develop other leaders that could do the work. It just wouldn't be me in the room or in the meeting. Oh, here's the other thing. I, I've shared this on other podcasts. So people that have heard this before would be like, oh, here he goes again. But there was one client that I had in which I looked at my calendar one week and I was invited to 13 of their internal meetings in one week. 13. I thought this is this is overkill. Like, and as I looked at, okay, what is my purpose? Generally speaking, then what is my purpose? What have I promised to do for, for this team? And it allowed me to say, no, I'm not going to go to 13. I might go to four or five this week, but I'm not going to go to 13 in one week. So, 
so the meetings thing was huge. I'll, I'll say something else too. So this is a super practical thing that I employed about a year ago that saved my sanity. Mm. I was the kind of guy, maybe a lot of people are this way, who um, every time I would get an email, it would pop up as a notification on my phone. Mm. So if I have clients where there's six different people that ask things of me and then I have multiple clients and I may be getting 25 requests that come all at once, it was really stressing me out. Yeah. And again, I would often read into the first few lines because that's all that would show up on my screen, the first few lines. I'd read into it and be like, what are they wanting me to do? What are they expecting of me? I just, I stopped it. I took the notifications off my phone. I have to physically go in and check the Thank emails you. now. And as a result, I'm able to, when you're consciously thinking, it's a lot harder to get bamboozled into doing things you shouldn't be doing. When you're busy doing five other things and then you get a notification, it's, it's easier to get sucked into things and even interpret things incorrectly. So yeah, just taking my email notifications off my phone a year ago saved my sanity. It gives you control instead of letting the device and the pop-ups and all the things like tell you what to do, you're in control of you spending your time. You've got a chapter in the book called Roadblocks and Building Blocks, and you have a section where you unpack one of the roadblocks to knowing your purpose. You mentioned that busyness is the thief of success. It tricks us into prioritizing the unimportant so we feel important. For those of us who suffer from busyness and prioritizing the unimportant, um, like every email that comes through is equally important on your phone. Um, how can we practically get better at eliminating this distraction? Mm, I think you mentioned this earlier about setting aside time to think about this year, what do I want to be true? This quarter, what do I want to be true? And then I think even taking it into this week, what do I want to be true? So that's a, a rhythm and a habit that in my the weeks where I really flourish and thrive, I do this. The weeks and mornings where I don't do this, I can absolutely feel it. And so it's thinking about what are the really important things that need to happen. There's going to be a ton that's going to come at me, but there's got to be three. I give myself three things in one week that I have to get done. Not a hundred things, but three things. Am I going to get more than three things done? Absolutely. But what are the three most important? So when that meeting shifts or something suddenly comes up or that phone call is going long, what are the things and the blocks of time that I'm going to say that is what is most important to me? And for me, I, I love to say yes. It, that helps me go, okay, I want to be effective in these three things. And then when all the busyness tries to swoop in, it makes it a little bit easier to go like, not today. Like it doesn't have to be a no forever, but it's just, oh, I would love to be able to get coffee. Not today, but let's look at a future time. And things have seasons and there are going to be seasons where we need to say no a whole lot more because there's a part of our life that's going to need a whole lot more of our attention and then there's going to be a new season that comes and so i think also remembering that the season we're in is not going to last forever and treating it for the unique season that it is is really valuable and important in that same chapter, um, you talk about the three building blocks of a strong purpose. You want to give me just a quick overview of those three building blocks? Yes, absolutely. So one of them is being others focused. I think our culture, it's really easy to become very self focused on how does this impact me? What's in it for me? What about my time? Why'd you cut me off? Like all of this me centered society. Our purpose, if it's me-centered, it's not going to compel us. But when it's others-focused, when we're on, when we have a purpose and when we're living out our lives in a way to impact someone else, there's a courage that naturally comes up in us. Um, I mean, you think about different examples of if you were to, you know, climb up on a super tall building to try to you know, get something that benefits you, you probably wouldn't do it. But if there is a child that is at risk of dying, if you don't climb up to that scary spot and save them, there's a courage that comes up. So when our purpose is others focused, it's going to be so much stronger. The second one is that it transcends seasons. I believe, and I, I can totally see other ways of seeing this, but I believe that a strong purpose 
isn't unique to our season or stage of life. My purpose is not centered around being a mom of an eight and 10 year old. My purpose is higher than that. It's true before I had kids. It's going to be true when they fly the coop and go off and live their incredible lives as adults. I think having language that transcends the seasons actually helps us move through those seasons and not go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought my entire purpose was being a mom to young kids. I don't know. That stage and that season, that was true, but your purpose might have been raising the next generation and you can still live that out without young kids at home. So it transcends seasons. And the last one is that it motivates you. I think language for you might be different than language for me, different than someone else that's going to make their heart beat a little faster. And when we have those words that help bring our purpose to life for us, it makes saying no a whole lot easier. It makes being courageous a whole lot easier. And it helps us risk and try new things because at the end of the day, we want our life to be able to count for something. And a lot of that's going to be wrapped up in our purpose. That is so good. I especially um, can identify with the fact that the purpose transcends seasons. And I've had to use that principle as a filter as I've looked at my purpose. And so several years ago, when I was kind of taking my, my consulting company in a different direction, I thought, I don't have purpose, vision, mission, or values. I, I, I just borrowed what every other company I'd been associated with had. And I was like, oh, let me just kind of co-opt theirs a little bit. So as I sat down and said, okay, what is really what is my company's purpose? And it must reflect my, my life's purpose. And I actually thought of my main company's purpose before realizing, oh, that's actually my life purpose too. I didn't realize they were one and the same. But mine is to uh, believe God for bigger things every day and serve others along the journey. And I know that sounds extremely kind of grand, um, maybe a little macro in nature, but as I look at all the things that I've done that are good, it, they've always been steps of faith and they've always been bigger, not bigger just for bigger sake, but just like you know, how sometimes how we view God depends on kind of what he's brought us through. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can start to say, okay, well, we think God's about this size now because this is what, and it's just like, okay, I'm going to take you up here just to show you my bigness. So, mm -hmm. so that's been my experience, but that's a, a the, I love the fact that, um, that, that you've, that you've written that you recognize that, that the purpose does indeed transcend some, uh, seasons. It really is a lifetime purpose. Um, you also have a chapter called writing writing your purpose statement and you mention the five questions of purpose what are the five questions of purpose yes so this is where i started to really wrestle when this topic it was about five or six years ago when i was realizing that the purpose that i was living out on my life was not the purpose i was going to be proud of and so I was going back through my library of books of anything about purpose, Purpose Driven Life, Start With Why, like incredible books, uh, Living Forward, about that, that touch on the topic of purpose. And the piece that was still hard for me to continue to wrestle with was I know why it matters. And I really want to put words to this, but like, help me do it. Like, what do I need to do? So that's where these five questions came from was through my own wrestling. And I think some people, there might be seven questions that they wrestle through, or maybe three of them are really important and the others aren't. But the five for me were, first, what are the stories that shape me? What are the things when I look back on my life, my moments, my years, what are those stories that have really shaped who I am? If I was to create a movie trailer of my life, what's going to show up on that movie trailer, that quick two minute version of Elizabeth's life and those stories that create pause for me, there's something in that. Like, what are those stories? The second one is what are the giftings that make me? I found over these past few years in when you encourage somebody, you're really great at this. Oftentimes there's this very bashful, diminishing response like, oh, anybody could do that. Oh, that's no big deal. And I started to think, wow, if we have this powerful gift in each of us that is very unique and we're diminishing it, it probably means we're not really maximizing and using it. And so taking the time to go, what are those unique gifts that I have? The things that I'm naturally good at. I was probably kind of good at those when I was 10. 
I, it was probably when I was younger that there were early signs of me being attracted toward this topic or this thing, whether it was drama or sports or math or critical thinking or what an imagination and creativity or getting work done, whatever that was. What are those giftings that are deep inside me? Because there's something connected to that most likely and our purpose, at least how we're going to live it out. The other three are what are the topics that shake me? Those things when someone brings up that topic, that injustice, that opportunity that we could just talk for, for, for hours about it. And it, it, we, we feel something when we talk about this. I want to be a part of what this is. There's probably some little hints to our purpose in those topics. Um, the investments that take me, where am I currently investing? Where is my mind? Where am I investing my thoughts? What am I thinking about? Where is my money going? Where is my time going? Where are my relationships going? Those investments that take us, they start to define us. And so when we kind of archaeologist style sift through and go, okay, where are those currently going? Maybe where do I want them to go? We might find some elements of our purpose. And then the last one are the perspectives that wake me. And I know for me, I can live a lot of my life living forward. <laughs> There are some people who are very reflective. They spend a lot of the time thinking about what's been in the past. But when we can go into the future and then look back, neither from here forward or from here backward, but actually think, what's the 80-year-old Elizabeth's perspective on this? What would the future me tell me? The future, like the current Elizabeth has a lot to tell the 20-year-old Elizabeth. But what does the 80-year-old Elizabeth have to tell the 41-year-old Elizabeth about life? And when I sit and reflect on that and take that perspective of toward the end of my life, what do I want to be true? It helps me be, be aligned a whole lot better to my decisions today. So good. Um, I'll comment on a couple of those those questions that you laid, laid out in your book. And for those that end up reading the book, what's going to happen is they're going to they're going to read these questions and things are going to come to mind. Um, when it comes to like, where's your giftedness? What is your giftedness? That should inform your purpose. Again, I love what I'll quote him one more time. What John Maxwell says, which is, you know, the purpose is kind of the intersection of your passions and your giftedness. You could be passionate about something, but not be very good at it. That's probably not your purpose. Or you could be okay, gifted at something, but not really enjoy it. That's not your purpose either. It's like where those two things collide, where does passion and giftedness, um, collide. So when I was um, reading through those. So you mentioned the topics that shake us. It, it, you know, I've always been the kind of guy who sometimes goes into denial about the things that upset me or that, you know, get me right. Oh, I don't want to think about that because how is that empowering? But when I read that question, I thought, oh, wow. So when you think about the topics that shape, that shake you, um, this is something that will help you discover and live out your purpose. So as you can imagine, one of the topics, not the only one of the topics that really shake me is something called workplace dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Hence why I wrote the book, Make Work Better. Right. It's all about like how to make, because I've noticed for the last, I've actually been in the workforce for about 20, gosh, 28 years now. And uh, workplaces suck. They just do. Um, now you're, um, the corporation that you've been associated with, Chick-fil-A, I think has the exact opposite reputation of that for good reason. I think it's a, just a great culture, well-led company, but um, a lot of workplaces are just terrible. So when you get into the idea of purpose and work, which is in the second part of your book, you talk about the connection between purpose and one's work. So I love how you wrote, if you can't align your personal sense of purpose to the work you're doing, you'll end up spending your 90,000 hours without strength of purpose as your foundation. So that is a very, so 90,000, that was a very sobering thought. Um, tell me more what you mean when you write, bring your purpose to your work without taking your purpose from your work. Yes. So the two are very distinct. So when there is an organization that we're gonna join, we have an opportunity that we can take our personal sense of purpose, knowing why we exist, and we can bring that into this great organization to help make it better. A lot of times what can happen though, is either we don't know what our purpose is, um, or we, we join this organization and we actually start to extract our purpose 
from the company. And here's what that oftentimes looks like. Whether it is expecting the company to have a clear purpose, even though I don't know mine, there's a lot with younger generations coming up, which I think is a scary thing, that if you expect the company to do something that you haven't done, there is a gap there. If we know our purpose, then I think it's great to say, I want to work with a company who has a clear purpose. But it's a lot to expect the company to have that, yet we haven't done the hard work ourselves. So that's one way it can look. Another way it can look is that we start taking our purpose from this company to the point that we start identifying ourselves, that that why we exist is this job. It's because I've been an engineer for the past 40 years at this place, or I was a pilot here, I was a secretary here. This is who I am. And when that day comes, And whether you're asked to or you choose to or your family encourages you to and you retire and you suddenly go, who am I? I think that moment can feel really scary. I haven't gotten to that season. I've definitely moved from different organizations and felt like small versions of that. But to go throughout a major career and then come to retirement, if we've taken our purpose from our work, when that day ends and we're not going to show up at 8 a.m. at that company anymore, we can find ourselves in a really dangerous place coming back to these big questions of like, why am I even here? So power comes when we can bring our purpose to our work, when we can actually help make the organization better because we're living out our purpose and we get paid for it, which is great. We get to live out why we exist for the good of this company and ourselves and we get paid for it. But the dangerous place is when we start taking our purpose from our work and we can get ourselves confused and sometimes start to find our identity in that business instead of our true identity that is connected to why we exist. Um, so th- this is incredible. Um, what would you say to someone who is feeling stuck and who may have gotten off track with living their purpose? Mm-hmm. It can feel very disorienting, I think, when we are stuck. And in the book, I tell a story about getting my scuba diving license. I was in high school and my um, brother and my dad were avid scuba divers. And so I wanted to join the ranks of adventures with them and go from snorkeling to getting to you know, really experience the ocean life. And so a part of that process, you do a pool dive and then you do a lake dive and then you do the big open water dive. And so the pool dive, you know, it's clear, it's great. The lake dive in central Florida that we chose, I think this, I think it was a a mud puddle. Like this thing was nasty. And a friend of mine and I with the instructor dove in, you couldn't see anything in front of you. It was very... Frustrating. I think sometimes when we feel off track, it can feel like that. It can feel like I can't even see the next thing that's in front of me. And there's something very interesting in scuba diving. When you're disoriented under the water, it is possible that you don't know which way is up, which is a very scary thing. And when you have a lack of visibility, that can be a real thing. Um, So one thing to do is you can watch which way your bubbles go. Bubbles are always going to go up. Sometimes you might not even be able to see the bubbles very clearly. And so you do something with your mask where you let water into your mask and then you watch which way the water goes in your mask to be able to know which way is up. And so when we're stuck in life, I feel like we almost need to do that kind of exercise to be like, okay, which way is up for me? And one of the best things to do is to just pause, to just take a pause. Remember the old Coca-Cola little adage of like a pause that refreshes, like having a Coca-Cola. It's kind of like take your little Coca-Cola moment. And as the busyness is spinning around you, that will never stop until you stop it. So take a pause. If you feel stuck, take a pause and think back on some of those recommendations for self-reflection. Change your environment. Maybe that means going away for a night or for three days, getting away. Maybe that means stepping into your backyard and putting in some headphones, something like get out of your typical environment and take a pause. And then I think take a deep breath. We uh, did a book club at a local bookstore in town on Monday night. And one of the girls, she was probably about 26, 27, 
She said with tears in her eyes, she said, when I first started reading this book, I just thought I'm so behind. I should know this by now. And some of those lies, those are lies. No, you're right on time. You're good. Like the fact that you're digging into these hard questions right now, it's perfect time. I think those lies can get in our head and they just make that feeling of being stuck worse. So take a pause that refreshes, get into a new environment, don't put pressure on ourselves and just start the process of asking the questions. And even if it takes three years to put words to, this is how I would articulate my purpose, it's the process of getting there that's gonna change you. It's the process of digging in and reflecting and once you have those words, they're really just for you because the words of your purpose may only be known by you, but everyone else around you is going to experience you living out your purpose. And that is what becomes really powerful. So for me personally, um, and I, I feel like I need to take a pause about once a week, not a long pause. Maybe I just need to go for a walk. Um, I've got a very nice, I think it's probably about a quarter mile long. A, a, we, we have a farmhouse, but there's like 23 other farmhouses around ours. It's probably about a quarter mile. We have a big soccer field and track that's probably about uh, half a mile long. I'll just go up there, listen to podcasts, and here's what I do because here's where I get off track. I get off track because inevitably some parts of our lives and our businesses, our careers, are in the higher level purpose, right? And then sometimes we get down into the tactics. And when we're down into the tactical for too long, it's kind of like being in that muddy area where you're training to do the scuba diving and you're like, I don't know which way is up. And it's like, wait a minute, are, are these my tactics or is these someone else's tactics? And sometimes you just have to kind of withdraw. What I put in my earbuds at times like that is, and sometimes I make fun of these, like I have podcasts I'll listen to that occasionally, I'm like, I'm not listening to this garbage because it's just too general. It's, it's, it's a little too pie in the sky. I'm thinking that's exactly what I need to listen to now because I need something to take me out of the tactical yeah. and put me into the sort of the higher level, yeah. more vision, more purpose oriented. And when that happens, again, I just need about an hour or so. I, I usually come back refreshed and I'm able to remember what my, what my purpose is. So so I'll say again, thank you so much for writing the book. Where can people get the book? Yes, um, Amazon. It is on Amazon. So The Strength of Purpose. And then there was the first book, The Power of Customer Experience. And they, you know, some are kind of like, that's interesting, like a personal purpose book and customer experience. But it goes back to that piece of when we know our personal purpose, we can bring that to life in our organizations in a way that we're going to be proud of, our customers are going to be thankful for, our organization is going to benefit from. And so we spend a lot of hours, like we talked about, in our work and serving customers, whether it's B2B or direct to customer. Um, so when we know our purpose and we know how to treat customers in a way, our, our life creates a better impact. And any business leader that is listening to this needs to get both books. They need to get the strength of purpose. It's going to help them. It's going to help their team. It's going to help their organization. They need to get the power of customer service as well. And when we just think about how I'm sure a lot of the lessons you learned that you shared in the book, you probably learned on the job at, within the Chick-fil-A Corporation. And again, everybody respects um, Chick-fil-A for its customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, So um, what is next for you? And, or, and what else do you have going on that you'd like to tell us about? Fun question. Next for me. So I am an entrepreneur in my heart. I love, and that's part of my, part of my purpose in creating value and galvanizing ideas for good um, and people for good. So what's next for me? My family, our eight and 10 year old and my husband, we started a sleepwear company in November. So we're two months in to this whole new adventure. It's called Slumber Sleepwear. And it is very luxuriously soft material. It's all for women right now. But I found this tension in my life between something that was comfortable for me, cute for my husband, and modest for my kids. And I didn't want to become an old lady. So that is this intersection of comfort and style. Um, so that is a big thing. We're learning a lot and having a lot of fun with that. Um, speaking and writing, I enjoy that a lot. So um, I love getting to work with audiences in workshops or more keynote style to help galvanize them and inspire them to make the daunting things of life feel doable, like purpose and customer experience. And then a majority of my time outside of my home, my home, my kids, and my husband, they're my jam. They're, they are a central part of my purpose. Um, 
but Trillith Foundation. And so I moved from Chick-fil-A over here to Trillith, which Dan Cathy, our chairman at Chick-fil-A, is our chief visionary officer for all things at Trillith. We're the largest movie studios in North America now, and 10 years ago was total, it was a cow pasture. And now we have a town and we have retail and U.S. soccer is coming to Trillith, which is so exciting. So the foundation, our purpose is to inspire human flourishing. And our mission for how we do that is to enrich the lives of the culture shapers who inspire the world. So from film to sports to music to entrepreneurs, the culture shapers are in those categories. And so we want to create mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, and relational resources to help them flourish so that what they create is most um, inspiring and enriching to the rest of the world. So those are my big next things coming up that I'm passionate about and I'm very honored to get to work on. Well, fantastic on slumber sleepwear. That's, that's actually very exciting. And for those that are that work in the entertainment industry, they probably know and have heard of Trillith, have probably worked here. I mean, this is there's a lot of employment that happens here from the entertainment industry and the movie studios. Um, I've run across a lot of people who are like, oh, really? The largest movie studios in North America is, you know, f five minutes from where you live? Yeah, it's actually right. It's a, I actually uh, lived two miles down the street from here. 30 years ago, oh, wow. we're 27 years ago. So I remember when this was nothing, right? It was, this was nothing. Now there's a town here and studios and then a town. So, um, but it, and speaking of, um, so with Trillith Foundation, you mentioned enrichment. Um, I got to attend an enrichment series talk that, that Dan Cathy gave just a couple of months ago. And what's it, and I've heard, you know, he's good friends with John Maxwell, so I've, he's been at some Maxwell events and I've heard him speak before and, and have known of him and, and kind of seen him from a, from a distance for decades now. But there was something that really stood out to me. So here's a guy who, his father starts Chick-fil-A and at some point he's the COO, then he's the CEO. And Dan is really the one, although true, it started, Dan is really the one that started to take Chick-fil-A, really progressed it, right? It, it, it was in more countries than ever before in more states more concept restaurants under Dan's leadership. And then of course, I'm, I hear about, you know, what was then called Pinewood back in the day thinking, oh, Dan's involved in that. Like, oh, wow, he's, he's just kind of getting into bigger and bigger things. And now again, there's, there's a whole town here. Um, but when he was speaking about his vision for Tripleth and kind of his purpose, and he talked about that legacy, he's like, well, what's going to happen 10 years after I'm gone? He said, that's what I'm thinking about right now. I thought, wow. So purpose doesn't just transcend seasons. It transcends your lifetime and actually the impact should go beyond so hearing that that day really made me think hmm am i thinking too small by only thinking a month ahead maybe if if dan kathy who's in his early 70s is thinking 10 years after he's gone you know so decades out so it was it was a huge so yes yeah, so the work you're doing here at trillith and with the fact is is making a huge impact for those and for those that don't know where trillith is located used to be considered, well, this is out in the middle of nowhere, like just nothing. I mean, yeah, there's a town just down that way called Fayetteville, which, I mean, is a, you know, a, a bustling town. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the impact and the, the purpose that you guys are living out here is huge. So thank you for all that you're doing with that. And, you know, there's one thing as you say that, that Dan lives out really well. And I think it's a great, a great quote as we think about our purpose and the how forward looking we are. And that is, I hope I don't botch it, but societies are made great when men and women plant seeds for trees that they will never sit under their shade. And when I read that quote, I thought that is Dan Cathy. And those great leaders that not only is it not about them, but they're willing to invest in the people, the places, the spaces, the experiences, planting the seeds that their life, they will never sit under, they'll never benefit from the shade that those tree, trees will provide. And I think when we think about what are the seeds, what's the shade actually that I want to create? And then what are those seeds that I need to plant today that will create shade in the future? We live out way more inspiring purpose-filled lives when we approach with that kind of mindset. For business leaders um, who do lunch and learns with their companies, and I've had some people that have contacted me lately saying, hey, I need, I need some who have the book, they bought the book for their, their teams to do lunch and learns and things like that. 
Those that are doing anything like that need to get this book and do a lunch and learn with your team. It's going to impact your company. It's going to impact the individuals on your team and as well as the power of customer experience too, especially for those companies that are that are customer centric by nature. So thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Let's make work better. Yeah.